All right, so pretend I've got red hair, right? And I'm not really me. So this guy's coming to the stage. He's got brown hair, he's dressed in all black. His name's Vernon Kessner. So give it up for Vernon. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you're too kind. What an introduction. Thank you, Adam and Alex. It was great. So anyway, I'm here today to talk to you about using Node and Grunt to create an awesome workflow. So right, I imagine most of you are probably thinking to yourself, who the heck is this guy, right? So this is kind of like the obligatory, this is me, uh, stuff coming up. I will keep it short, I promise. Uh, I am a developer advocate for Ally Financial. Uh, as Adam was talking about earlier, we're kind of the financial arm of GM. And so this is actually a brand new role with the organization. Part of it involves kind of leading the development efforts for our tooling and workflow for our front end teams at Ally. So question is, what are we gonna talk about today? So what we're gonna talk about is kind of ways that you can utilize Node and Grunt in your workflow and the tools that you create to be able to enable yourself and your entire team if the shoe fits, to be able to easier, uh, easily develop and maintain projects going forward so that you can be more efficient, so that you can be more rapid, so that you're able to focus on the things that you actually care about, which is innovating, which is pushing the web and moving the web forward. So before we get to actually looking at solutions, let's look at a, a few problems that we kind of faced and things that we dealt with so that hopefully you can use some of our experiences and take that and let it resonate with you and go back home to your work or your agency and, and, and let it in influence what you do. So here's a few, a subsection of some of our problems. For us, we have a pretty big team. I consider it a pretty big team, maybe tiny ants to you, uh, but it, for us, it's a pretty big team. We've got around 30 in our front-end development uh, 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 group. So that's just front-end stuff, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We've got a completely separate back-end team that handles everything else. Uh, we, the, the size of our team and the approach before led us to have some seriously tightly bound code. And so, and I'm not just talking about from a JavaScript perspective. I'm talking about JavaScript being tied to the DOM, being tied to your CSS as well. And so we had things not only just tied together that way, but we had pieces of code in files that really didn't belong there. They just got put there because those files got ordered before the next file that we really needed it to come before. And so that's some of the traps that we had fallen into in the past before we started separating as a front end, as a front end developer, before we started separating things. And that tightly bound code, while we're trying to introduce this brand new workflow, I mean, it was this, the, the tool set, the workflow, the process that we were trying to introduce at Ally was, was destructive honestly, to the process that we had followed up until that point, to the way that we had developed code. And so here you're coming into a pretty decent sized development group and you're introducing this new workflow, a new way of doing things, new technology at the same time, right? So we're moving, an example of that is moving from just doing CSS to SAS. Some of the folks in that group had never even heard of SAS, let alone used it before. And so this is a very invasive thing that we had to deal with. And while that was going on, we had enhancement work, so features to existing things. We had new projects come along. And at the same time, we had rolling maintenance updates. And so what that caused us to do was to have to support legacy code, not so legacy code, because it's kind of using some of the new techniques and approaches, and then new code. And how do we keep those pieces together? Because the legacy piece for us was separated into a completely different code base, entirely different repo. So for us, it added some time in. It, it required support from our business partners. But these types of problems here led us to ask ourselves several questions, some of which include how can we create a more maintainable code base? That's something that I think software developers have asked for years, right? We wanna make the code easy to work with. We wanna make the code easy for somebody else to pick up, to open up, to get into, and to be able to develop and execute against efficiently without having to spend an hour talking to you about what you've done in the code or, or trying to read through uncommented or cryptic source code because there was no, there's no style guide, there's no maintainability around it. 
How can we automate common tasks? That kind of gets back to the idea of being able to focus on things that we want to do. Let's get some of these automated, some of, some of these common pieces that we deal with, let's get them off our plate. Stop focusing on that stuff so that you can focus on the things that you want to. Uh, earlier this morning, Scott Gonzalez had asked, who's contributed to an open source project? You know, if you focus on your tooling, if you focus on your workflow, you'll be able to steal back some of that time and turn around and focus that on some of those things. So maybe you've never had an opportunity to contribute, but that's okay, right? You can make enhancements that doesn't take any more of your time and allows you to use your time to focus on moving the web forward rather than just doing the same old thing every day, right? We, nobody here is a code monkey, right? We don't, we're not just people that sit at a keyboard and type, although sometimes it feels like that's the way people treat us, right? It's, it's our job to kind of steal some of that back so that we can kind of move the web forward. How can we make debugging easier, right? We all know that most time as a developer, you're gonna spend more time maintaining code, opening up files that already existed, than you will creating a brand new file from scratch and creating something brand new. And so being able to make debugging code, especially in a larger team, an easier process was a really huge focus of mine when I started to look at how do we, well, you know, what, what does this tool set look like? Because I was really the, as far as our tool set, I was kind of the developer. I was the guy that kind of did everything. And, and so making it easier for a developer to, to, to debug problems. And so some of that is in the tooling, right? But some of that is in education as well. Some of that's in educating a development group how to use Chrome's developer tools a little bit better because they're not true. I mean, I can't remember. It's been a, a couple of years now, but man, was I shocked the first time I saw that little freaking cog in Chrome's developer tool, that wheel, the settings wheel. I was like, mind was blown because that thing opened up so much power. I was like, ah, where did this, how, what was this hiding way down here? I don't even know where. Now it's kind of up and like, hey, I'm here, come, come click me. But uh, you know, making it, making debugging easier was a big focus of mine. You know, I want to make it easier to do your job so that you could focus on creation. And then another big piece, I like documentation. I, no, that's weird, but I like, I like reading docs. I just, I just enjoy it. It's just something about it. I'm, I'm, I'm weird. Uh, but how can we create living documentation? If you have documentation around a project, it's generally the last thing that gets updated when enhancements are made, right? It's the last thing you're going to do. So the idea that I was like, how do we integrate documentation into the development process so that it's not a burden? for developers? How do we dynamically pull pieces together so that a developer doesn't have to worry about everything? That doesn't mean the developer doesn't have to write any documentation, but how do we automate some of this, this stuff? Because automation is not just for your build tasks and things like that. You can automate a lot of other things in, in the process of your workflow from beginning to end. And that's where Node and Grunt kind of came into our lives. Uh, from, a, from a corporate perspective, this is really our first foray into using Node, uh, anything related to Node, inside of our organization. Now, just like the note says at the bottom, Node and Grunt is not every tool in our tool bag, but it gives us a foundation to build upon. Node gives us the ability to have a full stack of JavaScript to develop against. Grunt gives us a nice, easy way, a common command structure to be able to automate tasks, to run tasks, and things like that. Now, I'm not going to get super technical because we only have 30 minutes, right? It's very hard to cram a lot of information into 30 minutes on a broad subject because Node and Grunt are both very broad subjects. You can talk a lot about them. And so, but that's our foundation. We use other things. We use Express. Uh, there's areas of what we just use Connect. Uh, we use Istanbul uh, to do code coverage reporting, that type of stuff. There's a lot of tools, but there's our foundation. And for us, it was very important for that stack to be in JavaScript. And for us, it was for a couple of reasons. Our backend technology teams at Ally are actually on a completely separate side. They're completely separated from us, from a front end team. I mean, we're in the same building and all that. I mean, we can talk, you know, we have communications, we don't fight, but they're a completely different organization. And so it was very important for us 
that our front end teams could contribute to developing those tool sets. And so that's, that's, that's a value, even if you're not a large organization, even if you're just a freelancer, that's just a, ju just a individual that nobody else is on your team. That, because you're a JavaScript developer, you can control every part of your workflow every part of your tasks, you can find the things that's like, hey, wait a second, this is kind of like a bottleneck for me. This is annoying. Anything that you do, when you go home and you start developing a project and you start doing something and you're like, this sucks, I hate this. Take a second and think if it's something you can automate. Can you even automate a piece of it, right? Because I, I don't know about you, but if something sucks in my life and I can just give 5% of it away, I'm gonna give it away. And so Node and Grunt allow you to do that. It allows you to take some of the things that you don't wanna do and give those things away. So real quick, before we get into solutions, uh, organization matters. When you look at Grunt files, anybody that's used Grunt in the past, you know the Grunt config, you, okay? So you know the Grunt configuration file can get like a mammoth file. If you're using multiple modules and things like that, you've got configuration, you've got custom tax, tasks set up in that configuration file. Organization matters in order to make your tooling, in order to make your workflow uh, maintainable. So separate your custom tasks, the configuration of the things that you do within Grunt. Now, the link here, this, this first link, that's a link to an article that Thomas Boyd wrote uh, September of last year, that's the little screenshot from that article. It's a great little way to look at separating pieces out to make your grunt files, your grunt configurations more maintainable. Now, I just added this earlier this morning. This actually was just published today on HTML5 Rocks. It's an article all about supercharging your grunt file. Some of the things that are inside of that uh, first link are included in this HTML5 Rocks article, uh, some of the information, but it also goes into a lot more uh, detail, which is why I wanted to, I wanted to really include it, because anybody that's used uh, Grunt before knows that, uh-oh, let's get that over on the right screen. All right, anybody that's ever used Grunt before knows that that file can get big. This is what our Grunt file looks like. With all the spacing, in all the custom tasks that we do, we've got custom tasks, we've got multiple configurations. It, it measures 43 lines. And that's with a lot of space because I'm getting older. I like space because I like to separate it so that I can read, right? And what this gives you, if you, let me zoom in here. What this gives you is in a way to organize the different tasks that you have, the different configurations that you set up. So here we've got ourselves a folder that everything's in our tasks folder. And these are our custom tasks. And then we have an options folder where we can set our configuration. And we just, we just export the, that configuration. And so it's a very simple file that's specific to JS Hint. And then we just use grunt load tasks to then load all those guys in at, at execution time. All right, solutions, right? That's what we're here to talk about is solutions. So let's get to it. But first, a word of warning. Some of the things that, 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 that we do, uh, namely with Grunt, we use it in ways that it necessarily wasn't intended to be used. Uh, an example of that is something like a long-lived server, which time looks okay, which you should probably see an example of that. Uh, if that's not necessarily what Grunt was intended for. It was kind of intended to run a series of tasks, exit, and let you continue on. That doesn't mean you can't use it that way. It's just a disclaimer that says, hey, we're using it a little bit different than what it was necessarily intended. All right, so solution number one, creating a more maintainable code base. So let's look at how we can create a maintainable code base. For us, we chose a component-based architecture. So, you know, say that component, say it modular, you know, whatever word you want to use, but it was a way of separating pieces out, of rather than having everything tied together and have multiple files that had multiple pieces, let's separate these guys out. And now we've got, like, more files than you could shake a stick at, right? You, you want to have a file battle, I've got a lot of them. I got lots of files, not even my node fo modules folder. We've got lots of files. And one of the things, one of the tools that we use, because we've got a larger team, we heavily leverage jQuery UI's widget factory. And we do that because jQuery 
even for people that, that like to diss it, I don't know if that's actually a word that people use anymore, but I'm gonna use it. Even if people like to diss it, jQuery has a beautiful API, right? Even the people that don't like it are like, yep, that's got a good API, they've thought it out. I mean, even their URL schemes for the API docs are well thought out. Like if you understand the URLs, you can type the API URL for any method inside of jQuery without ever even having to search for it because the URL schemes are thought out. jQuery UI's widget factory is very similar. So it's an enhancement. Uh, I forget who it was, but somebody actually did a talk yesterday that included uh, jQuery UI's widget factory, but it's really enhancement on how jQuery plugins work. It solves some of the issues that jQuery plugins had like state and things like that. And, but what it does is it allows people from different levels of JavaScript to contribute to some more complex pieces than maybe what they would have had they had to do it on their own. It gives us common patterns, right? It contributes to that maintainability because we're all following the same practices. We're all following the same styles. We're all following the same APIs. And so any of our visual pieces utilize this uh, jQuery UI's widget factory. And so this image on the bottom is just kind of like a slice of our homepage and just kind of highlighted how, how we would look at it. And looking at it, I actually forgot a rectangle because there's a button and that's a component of its own. But this is a good example down here, this row. These are four icon tiles. Now I shouldn't have to develop different pieces. If this, these are more complex, I shouldn't have to develop different pieces just to do the same thing, right? I don't want to copy and paste and just change little bits of code. That, that's very, that's where you get the highly coupled JavaScript from. And so what this is, if you've ever worked in Backbone, what you could see here is item view, item view, item view, item view, and then a grander collection view. And so that's what we want to do. We want to build those JS Legos that you might have heard about a little bit earlier so that we can just pick and pull and put in and then craft something that looks like this, but craft it like that. Something that used to take, and, and this is real world, something that used to take our developers two to three hours to do they can create a layout in less than 30 minutes now because of the separation of things that we've done. If it doesn't have new functionality, if it's using things that we've created with this component-based architecture, they, we can rapidly put things out. And that's very important. Linting, testing, and style guide. I think I'll talk about, oh, I gotta get moving. We're kind of behind the time. Uh, linting, testing, and style guide. We're using JS Hint, uh, QUnit, uh, we're running it with Car uh, running those tests with Karma, and then we've got this living style guide, which we'll look at here in a second. For 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 uh, our HTML templates, we're using Handlebar templates, and we're also using SAS and Compass. And that speaks into the reusability part. So once we separate these concerns, we, we do that by leveraging HTML conventions. So that our th so and, and generally what that is, is you have a container class. Think of a jQuery UI widget. You have a container class, and then you have your conventions built out inside of there. And now you have this nice little chunk that you can turn around and reuse over and over and over and over again. And those things aren't tied to HTML elements. Right, it, it, when you begin to think about it and look about it, uh, matter of fact, some great talks that have happened at jQuery conferences by Doug Niner on contextual jQuery. If you've never seen them, do a Google at YouTube or Vimeo, actually they're on Vimeo, uh, just Google Doug Niner contextual jQuery. Those videos will change your life in the way that you approach jQuery, the way that you think about how you work with elements, with widgets. It, it, it's really eye-opening. And those, those HTML conventions are a big part of that. Configurable components, being able to override the data in these points so that when I pull a Lego into something, I can change it into the data that I want to see and then reusable layout. So remember I was just saying the developer can develop a layout in like no time flat? That is actually a snippet from just a simple test layout. And so we've got some utilities that we've developed that we utilize Node for, we utilize Express especially for this point, but Node and Express to be able to do helpers like pseudo content for two, two paragraphs or an image that floats to the right or you know bring in a uh, one of the HTML conventions, bring in a handlebars template to give us a panel. These are, this is an entire layout, header to footer, the entire thing, because you think about the HTML conventions. Thinking about those conventions is where you gain a lot of efficiency because you can create things that you can just rapidly deploy and develop over and over and over again and build upon. Solution number two, tooling focused on creating an efficient workflow. So this is the biggest part, right? We've got that down. We've got the separation and all that. Then, but if you don't have the tools, 
the other stuff, it's great, but it doesn't help you as much as it could. And so that's where this next part came in. And when, when, when I started to look at it, I realized we really had two unique workflows. We had the workflow that consisted of kind of a testing cycle, hot fixes, that type of thing. And then second, we had new and enhancement efforts. So new projects going on, enhancements to existing features that were already on the site. And so both of these, from a tooling perspective, both of these use very similar components, right? They're both gonna use SAS, for example. But from a mental approach, from the way you approach the project, they're distinctly different, right? Because when I'm in a testing cycle, my code is already deployed to some testing environment somewhere, which means I, everything that I work on from that point with that, I'm working from a completed point back, right? I'm, I'm starting at the end and I'm walking backwards. Whereas the second workflow, my, my mental approach is completely different. I, I have the benefit of being at a corporation. So when I look at something from a, from a new project standpoint, I, I, may, I may go have a, a, a talk with our design manager, right? I may go talk to somebody from, from information architecture. I may have those conversations. And if you don't have a large corporation, there's huge communities around all of these, the, all of these disciplines that you can get people's feedback on. And that workflow is where you get those pieces. So the first, th these two workflows spawned two parent tasks for us in Grunt. The first task was this preview task. And it's a really awesome task in my opinion. I'm gonna kind of blow through this because I really wanna do a, a, a live demo of some of the stuff for you. But it's very cool because it allows us to actually reverse proxy against over 25 different environments. And so what that means is on my local machine, I can spin up a server using a simple Grunt task. I can spin up a server and then intercept every request to that server and I can proxy it against any environment. And what that means is I can spin it up and I can say, hey, go to ally.com or localhost 9001. In our case, it's localhost 9001. When I go to there, if that asset does not exist locally, it just proxies it through to whatever environment I've chose and then brings it back in. So what that allows you to do is actually see what your local code looks like against whatever environment you're having an issue in, whatever environment you're debugging in. If a production issue pops up, you can do this reverse process locally on your machine and see what is it gonna look like before it's ever been deployed to an actual environment. That's a huge time saving right there. That's a huge thing because you can work locally. It gives us the ability to work against live data sources. Now the second workflow, we can mock data, we can mock requests, that type of stuff, but this workflow allows us to, to make, make live requests against our data and not have to worry about domain issues or anything like that. This third one's actually very cool. So say you know you're going on, say I'm gonna go on a trip, I'm coming to San Diego, and I know I need this response from this service. I need this JSON file or this JSON response that I get back when I ping this service. We have a separate task, a localized task, that actually you can use Grunt to then turn around and pull down. All you gotta do is use, you, use a simple module to be able to pull down that asset and actually localize it locally. And now, because of the reverse proxy, because that file exists in your local system, you'll serve against that. So maybe you have an HTML file that you wanna kinda of mess around with to see what's it gonna look like. Localize it. And all of those localized assets go into a simple dot file. You can do it clean and it'll just clean everything up that you've localized and you don't have to worry about serving those anymore. So that's, a, I mean, those ideas right there, those are great if you can go back and see how they fit to your situation. How do they fit to your environment? How can you implement those types of things? Selective compilation, we've got a pretty big app. We separate things from a theme perspective. And so I don't wanna have to build the entire application every time I'm doing something. That's, that's, that's painful for me, it's worthless. Like I'm not using 75% of that. So I wanna selectively compile those pieces. So I can pick things like a theme and I can say, hey Grunt, just by passing a couple flags to it, I can let Grunt know, hey, from a watcher perspective, I only want you to watch the global files and the bank files. Just leave everything else alone, don't, don't worry about that. And so you can do those things with Grunt. You've got control over that because you're, you can write JavaScript. That's the beautiful thing about Node and Grunt. And then we also use source, source maps to aid in debugging. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it now because I'm running out of time. If you don't know what source maps are, Google them. There are some issues with them if your builds don't work exactly right. They've been wonderful for us because it allows you to basically see source files in your editor rather than the concatenated file. So if you pull 10 files together into a single one and you, make, you have a type error in ajax.js, 
your, your console is going to show an error in ajax.js, not global.js or whatever your concatenated file is. And it's, a really nice, it's a really nice tool. There are some issues around it if your builds don't work right. So the second one, this is the cool one that I, I really like because it's all about new stuff. It's all about creation. And so this is our local task. And what it allows us to do is it allows us to rapidly develop layouts and components. It allows us to do live previews. So examples of things that you're creating quickly, like rapidly, and it generates our living style guide. Now we're also using Yo for scaffolding. We've got a couple custom generators to scaffold out a couple of things, but real quick, you can't see my terminal because it's over here, but I'm just going to run grunt local. And what that does, grunt local just spins up a, an express server, sets up a watcher, and now our files are being watched and I've got this express server. This is our living documentation that my development, that the, team, the teammates on our team, this is being dynamically pulled together by a lot of information. So this is just a simple little quick, I want to see what the git log looks like. But so let's look at a component right real quick. So let's look at the buttons component. This is all the HTML convention, the dependencies, the contributor section, all dynamic. That data is elsewhere. I don't want to type things twice. If it exists somewhere, let me pull it from there. Don't make me type it two times, right? I don't want to open a file just to add my name to the contributor list. That's not maintainable. That doesn't get updated. That's not living. And so what we need to do, those pieces are pulled from a couple different JSON configuration files for this, but this pulls in the handlebars template and then any dependencies that are set up as well. But this is really the cool one. So these are live examples. That's an awful style for, for, the base, for that base button. But let's look at that primary button. So there you see you've got, that's a live preview. Cool thing, if I kick it, I can have a live preview of that button anywhere that I can share. It's full URL. I have a configuration, so I know what needs to happen. I have an HTML snippet that says, this is what, in order to do this thing, this is the HTML that would be required to do that. So in this case, let's zoom in here. In this case, I just need to add a couple classes to get that. But what if, what if I wanted to add JavaScript? That file that we were just looking at with all the usage examples, that's it right there. The, that's how the examples are created. It's just a simple markdown file using some GitHub fenced blocks. And in the background, we're just using Express to intercept these requests. We're using the routing on Express to be able to say, hey, let me intercept this, pull it together, and then we're just using some regex to, 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 to parse all this and spit it out. We're using Code Mirror for the editor stuff. So here we've got our partial. These are, this is a custom fence, but we just look for it with regex. That's our partial that comes in. And then we just set up the JSON configuration, the preview, all that, the HTML, the rendered, the actual compiled handlebar template all happens on the back end inside a node. A developer never has to look at it. They never have to think about it. You don't want to type that snippet twice. You've already created the convention. Why are you going to type that HTML again? The, the template's already there. So, but here's the cool thing. This is what I really like. So here's our primary button. So now what if I want to add some JavaScript? So we're at jQuery. So we'll say button text is stay classy San Diego, right? And now if we come back and we refresh this, now our button actually says stay classy San Diego. That's because we're able to use Node in the background to dynamically pull all these pieces together to be able to use that file. Now, if we look at, sorry, I get excited, I get excited. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I get excited, sorry. I hate you. I only got a minute and 30 seconds left. Don't applaud yet. You might be short on a break. Uh, no, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So but the cool thing is if we look at this, this is actually, we're, we're pulling this file together. This, every single example, this works for layouts and components, uses the very same template for Node. And we're just pulling all of those configuration pieces together to generate an actual HTML file. So there's our dependencies that we've defined inside of our component. There's some dependencies from a JavaScript perspective. But if you look way down here at the bottom, Alex Sexton, don't look at this because we trust these people's user input and we didn't validate it. 
But if you look down at the bottom, there's our instantiation text. And so if you have things that you need to do to instantiate an example, you can add that right in a simple little JavaScript block and it happens, right? You don't have to do anything crazy. It's about working easy. It's about working, just, just it's about working easier, right? I like, I like to work hard. I work hard, but I like to do it easily, right? I don't mind working long as long as I can work easy. You know what I mean? I like to kind of focus on some things. All right. Running out of time. So close that out. But dynamic, dynamic previews. Awesome, aw awesome stuff. Because it's so, can you imagine if you can develop an example of a component that you developed and all you have to do is open a markdown file and edit a little fenced block that like you're creating a gist? I mean, that's, it's just so awesome. I love it. I mean, I was excited about it when I did it, obviously, right? It's not a surprise. An intelligent and simple build system, last solution. That's not simple at all, but it is freaking awesome, right? Have you ever seen a Lego car? <laughs> I want one of those, really. I mean, I don't want it to be like my nice car, but I would like to go to Target or Target in that car right there and see how many Legos get added when I come out. I mean, that would be awesome. <laughs> my kids would love it for sure. So, but last thing is just an intelligent build system. So automate as much as you can. Our, our build system, just like we could do the selective build with the reverse or the selective proxy with the reverse proxy, our build system allows selective builds as well. Because if you're working on, on a line of business, uh, say the bank line of business, and you don't have anything to do with the auto theme, then, then you don't care about building that auto theme. It's not relevant to you. So selective, selective builds make your build times faster, which makes you more efficient. We have several steps that are managed by one task. We have JS hint, we have QUnit that runs by Karma, we've got Uglify, we've got SAS, we've got image optimization, we've got uh, Istanbul code reporting, we've got Plato reporting for code complexity, and just run it and walk away. Go get a Coke or a cup of coffee or do something else. Generate, create something. And then also dependencies. This is the last little piece here. We weren't able to implement a system like uh, AMD or Browserify with CommonJS modules, anything like that, because of that whole legacy, not so legacy, new approach. And I feel like that's probably a problem that's more common than just in my world, right? I mean, sometimes you feel like you're the only one that feels that way, but it's really not the case. And so our, we, we just use a simple Uglify configuration to set up those pieces. Our SAS dependencies, oh, let me just show you this real quick. I'm sorry, I'm a minute and 50 seconds over. Slow down. Time. I need one of those click buttons like Adam Sandler had. Of course, then you wouldn't be able to hear me. Uh, oh, yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. Gosh, it's so small. But our SAS dependencies, if you look, so look at our, our global CSS here. And the way that's set up, we have a few files. Everything that you see in the root of a theme there. That's all concatenated pieces. So, so those end up being our concatenated files. And that way you kind of separate. And the only thing that really goes into here are just some import, just some simple imports. Let's pull it all together, right? Let's get everything together and generate the file. Let's let the compiler worry about that. Now, quick word of warning, and this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be done, I swear. Uh, quick word of warning. SAS does compile kind of slowly. Right, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a dog if you gotta use Ruby. If you like, you gotta port through, it's a dog, it's, it's slow. I mean, it's, it's just about as slow as it is if you're just using it, but it's slow. If you don't use Compass, you can use LibSAS, which is a C, C++ compiler, much, much faster. If you have the opportunity to do that, do it. Uh, but we use Compass, so we're kind of leveraged to that right now, hoping for support in the future. But then, JS with Uglify. Bottom line, Node and Grunt have allowed us to rapidly increase efficiency in every phase of development from start to end, from the beginning thought of a component to debugging the production defect. We're able to utilize Node and Grunt all the way through that process, and you can too. I, I'm not like super smart. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm not dumb, right? But I'm not super smart. And, 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 and I was able to pull it together, right? Yeah, so you can do it too. So thank you. There's my Twitter and my email, Ally.